հարայեցին հաճարմոյևի իտարգունա, որ մասմանութիս կանդիս ենազը տաշեմիս իրատուվակ, որ իվի գատլավ սակարտովոշի հերթերի ոլազը ոկուվահումի սերանի ողնից իտրեղա Հանսապտրելությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությ
very happy in a university environment. So I'm very happy being with you. Let me talk about what I teach at the university. I change courses. For a while I taught a course called um, Pictures and, popularly among the students, Pictures and Birds, but a sort of a survey of um, the uh, uh, connection um, between painting and literature, a sort of a history of relationship between painting and literature. They are, as you know, called sister arts, uh, arts that perhaps aim at addressing the same poem, the same thing, moving human heart with pictures or with words. Um, in, that, uh, in that course, our syllabus was from starting with Plato to Borges. Uh, um, we followed what is picturely in literature and what is literary, uh, literary in, in art, um, uh, art of the painting. Then I taught also other courses. Um, uh, I taught courses in literature, comparative literature, I gave seminars in, um, I gave a seminar called The Art of the Novel. It's uh, essentially based on teaching Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Stendhal, Henry James, Virginia Woolf, other writers. Um, then we will uh, read some essential books and discuss them. Then I also occasionally teach well, also my books. My name is Red which is also about painting, medieval, and in generally speaking, Islamic painting. Um, then I also uh, taught uh, or, uh, courses in history of relationship, sometimes based on my book, uh, Snow, Islam, Democracy, Secularism, or Laicite, the relationship between political Islam and general trends like that. They, these are political subjects, especially in the United States. Then I also taught my other books in classes, Black Book, always uh, opening the book from, um, to subjects that it explores. Uh, this, my academic life is like this. I don't have a PhD, but since all the universities know this, they give me thank you very <laughs> kindly. Uh, honorary degree. So, all, you know, all of lots of members of my family, my brother, my cousins, they all have PhD. But since I'm a writer, I never had it. But late in life, I covered the distance. I'm happy about that what you gave me. Thank you so much today. I'm now. This is what I do at the university. But you don't have to ask me university questions. I'm open to all topics, even some politics, but not too much. <laughs> which I respect a lot, and it's like, what do you want most in life? And I'll tell you, a peaceful nine hour sleep. <laughs> Not because I'm troubled by um, problems, but just simply, it's, I think, hereditary. My father was also like that. Uh, I sleep four hours and I wake up. I have to be right, do something, do then again I sleep. I always envious of people who sleep like a child. It's not that I cannot fall asleep. I immediately, if I go to take a nap here, I can even start sleeping here. But in 20 minutes, I'm awake. Uh, uh, I want to sleep continuously nine hours, and I also uh, want to remember my dreams. Uh, you know, you wake up in your childhood and you go, oh, I see, oh, oh, you tell, I want, I, this doesn't happen to me, I'm also sad about that. Okay, we should have uh, nine hours. Thank you, <laughs> with some dreams, yes. Okay, uh, the lady, you're Mr. Pamela, nice to meet you. I'm interested in a little policy of him. Um, I said now, Vladimir Putin is nominated as a Nobel Peace Prize. And how would you uh, concentrate on this thing as a Nobel Prize owner? Including the fact that uh, Georgia has been occupied by Russia in 2008 and 
Crimeans right now, currently there's I some see. Russian troops and other militants. I, I understand there is a, 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 a anger here against Mr. Putin. I don't think he's going to get any prize. Um, um, but that, uh, the, uh, the subject is related to Nobel Peace Prize, which I don't know about, and I don't want to comment about it. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. now say one more. No, uh, no, one question at a time, yes. Mm -hmm. They have to be a bit more questions at a time. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find then. other people to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Other questions, can I hear you? Please, if uh, someone asks a question, please neatly raise your hand so you will be the next one and the, can, yeah, yes. uh, and the microphone comes to you. Yes. Yes. I gave at um, Harvard University. Uh, the title of the title was "Naive and Sentimental Novelist." There, I argued that um, um, uh, that there are two kind of uh, writers and actually readers. Naive writers or naive poets are the ones who are not who are, whose minds are not busy with technique, morality, this or that. They just write as if as it's as if coming from God. They are not worried about technique and they are not self-conscious. Then there are the writers who are, and I'm also uh, one of them, more modern, more worried, more, uh, more troubled by morality, technique. They are more worried whether their text is addressing what he or she wants the readers think about. Um, uh, I am in these kind of writers or readers, we call, I call, the, this distinction is based on Friedrich Schiller's famous distinction between naive and sentimental poet, but it's also, I realize, that can be applied to fiction writers. Um, then I also, in, that, in those lectures, argue that each novel has a hidden center. Uh, that when we read a novel, we are searching for a hidden center as, as if we are someone lost in a wood and looking for a meaning or for some place that we cannot reach. In a wood, you can see the trees one by one, but the general landscape, layout, plan of the wood is impossible to see. This is more or less how we feel when we are lost in the forest of the novel that we are trying to understand why does this oil writer show us this whale or this city or this street or this character we read and read and read and read take more distance to, to reach this center the meaning of the novel what I, the reason why this novel is written anyway um, sometimes we reach it sometimes we don't um, when I wrote that piece, I definitely knew that that book is for theoreticians, uh, people who read theory, for students, but not for popular readers. Now, the popular reader also reads the book, uh, uh, more like a naive reader. Uh, the popular reader also asks these questions in a naive way. What's this book about? Why did Pamuk gave 600 pages to this subject? What's happening here? Why is char this character doing this and thinking this? What's the point all about this? Whether they are popular 
where, whether they are most common readers or very sophisticated Harvard professors, they all, our minds all do these same things when we read novels. Then, whether my most popular reader it reaches the secret center that I argue that exists at the heart of the novels, I don't know. But, of course, every reader, whether a popular reader, whether a reader with good education, or whether a good reader, they or everyone reads my novels in his or her way. And, in fact, being a novelist is already believing in that, believing in multiple readers, believing in that there is not one interpretation. I'm not saying that all interpretations are possible, but I know from life that there is not one interpretation, and the writer should not be an authoritarian professor. No, you misunderstood my novel. I didn't mean that. I never say that, that everyone reads my novels in a different way. I am a professor just for the fun of it. I am a more serious fiction writer which means that I respect the elasticity of the interpretation of the readers, my readers, popular or the most educated. Yes. Maybe I'll take another question. Just a second. Could other people who have questions raise their hands in the bar so that we'll go where it goes? Hello, Mr. Kamuk. I'm glad to see you today. Uh, my uh, question is connected to literature. What would be your advice to youngsters who are uh, going to or could wish out to become a writer? I always make this joke, but I won't, uh, I won't pursue that joke. I always say that. A young person who wants to write books and needs advice from me, well, the first advice, don't take advice from old writers. <laughs> But then, of course, they are frustrated, so you have to give some advice to uh, be yourself. Yeah. Just don't decide to be a writer because you enjoyed one book. If you're reading 100 books in three months and want to continue, you can be a writer. If you cannot go walk in a street and when you see a bookshop and cannot stop yourself and enter into it, then perhaps you may be a writer. Um, uh, being a writer is a long, running a marathon, you know. You don't aim for one book, you aim for a whole life, uh, for a whole set of novels. Um, my, if I advise is that it's a long distance running. It's not one single shot, it's not one painting, it's not one beauty contest, it's not one, um, it's not one marriage, it's a lot of things. It's a lot, it's a lifestyle. Prepare yourself for the failures. In, if you're enjoying writing, if you're enjoying being alone in a room and dreaming, and even without, beside that, you're filling pages and feeling happy with what you fill with your pages with, then you can be a, a, a writer. In fact, that, uh, one of the reasons I managed to be a writer is that I was raised to be with my, by my family to be a painter. That is, to be a, man, a solitary man doing his thing, like a boy playing with his toys. That's why I always make uh, this, use this metaphor. Um, um, uh, but on the other hand, um, if you need the company of other people, talking and laughing, smoking and going to movies, the, uh, the sense of community, friends, chatting, giggling, you can't be a writer. This is what I think. Um, I, I decided to be a writer because in the end I understood early in life. That is, I think, one of the good things that I did. That in early life I understood that I don't want to go to an office and give orders to people or take orders from my superiors. I realized that I, can, I don't want this in life. So what's left? Very little is left, actually. Um, uh, then being a writer or being a painter is left. I like uh, British poet, uh, uh, poet Philip Larkin once said about being a librarian. If you don't want to, if, if you can't do all the things you want to do in your life and you realize you can't do them, and if you don't want to do a lot of things in life and you continue not to want to do them, 
the only thing you can be is a librarian, he said. <laughs> um, and being a writer is also like that, but it's a better than being a librarian. Borges was both a librarian and a writer, uh, and there is a connection in between, uh, in the sense that you want that solitude. You are angry to people, and you know that if you work with them, it will, you will not go back home happy. I need the company of other people, but not very much. Also, what was important for me, that early in life I decided that I want to live a life, even this small cubicle, little one meter, one meter roof, but with my paper, with my pencil, uh, uh, and I thought this, this was important. I, may, I, I managed to make myself a writer because I thought living alone in a room was a satisfactory life. Still, more or less, I'm living alone in a room and writing and writing, and I find this kind of life very satisfactory. If you can, if you find this satisfactory, now that you need an advice, if you find that happy living in a room alone, 40 years, I'm doing it almost for 40 years, then you can be right. In the end, they will publish you. In the end, they will read you because you endure for 40 years. <laughs> You're welcome. Unfortunately, I can't speak any Turkish while I'm an Orientalist. Uh -huh. uh, yes, Professor of Iranian Studies. And I'd like to ask you, I uh, want to uh, continue in your novels that uh, you think that uh, differences between the West and East can't be overcome. And do you still think so? And uh, um, don't you think that our Caucasian region uh, could be a kind of bridge between two kinds of civilization. I see. Thank you. Okay, first, um, I used to, oh, um, I think now, I'm writing books for the last 40 years. In my early youth, I used to over-dramatize uh, and make, over, make too many comparisons between uh, belonging to Eastern civilization, West, East, West. In my early novels, I did this uh, more than I would like to do it now. That, say, my early novels are were more busy with what at that time called problematics of East, West, uh, books that were Edward Said's Orientalism, other books, West's uh, impact on uh, East, uh, uh, theories of identity, so forth and so on. I was, my mind was very busy. But Turkish history was also very busy with these issues. Uh, please don't forget that Turkey's place on the map, Turkey's history, uh, as we all know, is that Turkey is located between Europe and Asia, and its history is also a history of uh, intermingling and clash of um, East and West. So uh, Turkish history, cultural history, Turkish politics is also made of this clash. So I took it seriously. Also, previous generation of many writers, the uh, Turkish, uh, great Turkish writer Tampunar, who influenced me, were also busy with these subjects. So in my early years, till I was 45, 50, my mind was more busy with um, East, West, clash, Orientalism, imperialism, whatever. My mind is less busy with these subjects in the last 10 years. Perhaps Turkey is now is a richer, bigger, more stronger country. Uh, anxiety of European influence is not that important anymore. And because of many, many other reasons, I am thinking less about what you uh, uh, reminded me as East-West identity problems. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hello, I'm very interested about how do you feel when you finish each of your story? I mean, are you kind of relaxed or you are safe? Okay, depending on, I understand your question. There are uh, sections in a novel that you're so happy about or moods that you discover as you write your novel, your story, whatever. Uh, 
that a sort of a sort of a catharsis happens. You're happy. What you thought about in the end, you managed to put in a paper even better than your dream. That is a cathartic moment. You're happy. You're happy. You're jumping. You're happy being a writer. But that uh, these paragraphs, pages are not necessarily at the end of a book. When you write a novel, it's 500 pages. My novels are comparably long, 500 pages, 400 pages. Then there are uh, what they call serendipities. That is, some beauty comes that's not you plan. Then you're happy. You write it. You say, "Wow, oh, thank God, I'm a uh, you know writer." Then there are times that you're not writing well. You're frustrated. Maybe the uh, subject that you thought about doesn't come out like that. Being a writer, being a professional writer, is manage, is learning to manage these situations and your reactionary moods and being managing in, in them in such a way that you don't leave the pen out or you don't be, oh, I can write so easily. That being a writer is also managing your moods to write that novel. I, uh, my little theoretical thing is this, that for every novel I wrote, now that you gave an example for saying story, in fact, for every story we write, we have to change our character or our habits or our persona or our mind in such a way that we should be the, uh, the right person to write book. Say I'm thinking of a novel set in, like my name is Red, set in, in uh, 1591 Istanbul, then I have to change myself in a way to be able to write that novel in a fruitful, perfect way. So being a novelist is not a thing about sitting at this table and writing and managing yourself. Also, managing your dreams, managing your character for that novel. When that novel ends, then you say, what next? Then read for that new one, prepare yourself for the new one. Yes, writing books is always uh, dangerous in the sense that you can't write them, so you're not happy, or sometimes you're very happy, but it never ends. That when I finish a story, when I finish a novel, I am already thinking about the next novel. Uh, when I finish a novel, I'm now thinking about publishing it. In first, I always publish my novels in Turkey. How will the publication say? How what will my enemies say? What will these people say? What will other people who had liked my previous book will say? You always worry. It's part of it's part of the nature of being a writer. But then a shoe seller or a shoemaker is all or a, anyone a doctor is also worrying. Everyone is worried about his job. Yes. Uh, young lady. Thank you. Mr. Pavlik, you just mentioned that Turkey has become increasingly stronger and important during the last decade. And uh, how do you see the future of the Turkey? Like, do you think that the future of the Turkey lies with the EU? Because for me, Turkey is already very important, already very strong, and the original leader, sort of. And I can't see why would Turkey want to be in the EU. I think you, can, you can see or cannot see? Cannot. Because I think that Turkey should become Europeanized and more liberal on its own terms and continue to be the original power without the EU. So do you see Turkey's future in the EU? Or do you see Turkey's future on its own? And can you, do you think that Turkey needs the EU or the other way around? Thanks. A good question. And, uh, say, um, I was uh, ten years ago. I was very busy promoting Turkey in its negotiations with EU. Um, the, that um, Turkish intellectuals or Turkish intellectuals who believe the, the idea that Turkey should join EU, and I was one of them. I also wrote articles about that. That I that when I promoted my books, and sometimes only for that occasion. I went to various European countries and to promote that idea. It was a political idea in many ways, not internationally only in Turkish and European relations, but also in Turkish politics. Defenders of Turkey's entry and negotiations with the European Union were arguing that this will be first good for Turkish legal system, economical system, Tur uh, more importantly, for Turkish political system uh, because of European standards of free speech, human rights, respect for minorities, so forth and so on. And so the argument then was a bit um, 
utilitarian. Well, let's have European Union, so all these institutions, free speech, respect for minorities, full democracy, army should not be involved, we will have with the help of European Union. And partly this work, the European Union get involved, Turkish government, Suber, negotiated with them, okay, you're saying um, um, this criteria, that criteria, let's implement them, so we will negotiate. This negotiation process was also helpful in economy because at that time people think, well, Turkish economy is getting a decent economy, uh, so let's make investments, international money uh, lenders begin to talk. It worked for a while. But then, first thing, there was a resistance in Europe, there was a resistance in conservative Turkey, and there was a resistance in anti-European and nationalist sentiment in Turkey, a nation sentiment in Europe. It was not, first of all, politically working. It was not, Turkey was not getting there. Then after, two, uh, 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 probably after 2010, tense, Europe began to be troubled by its own euro problems, this problem, that problem. Then Turkey began to get more authoritarian and more uh, uh, nationalist, uh, because of Cyprus, because of Kurdish um, issue. So there was a cooling of the relationship. Now, it, uh, now there, uh, the Europe and Turkey is not a hot subject anymore. Turkey's dreams of or people like me, and, and I'm, not only, I'm not the only person, millions of people in Turkey believe in joining European Union, but it's not easy now. But if you ask my sentiment, I'm not crying. Europe is busy with its own problems. Turkey is even busier with its worst problems in its history. So not much is happening in that direction. Uh, if, uh, once in a while, either from Turkey or either from European Union, some person said, oh, let's heat it up, let's cheer it up, let's start again. But it doesn't work because both sides are busy with their internal problems. Okay, maybe I'll take another question. Uh, yeah, just two more questions, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Nina, please have the line in with that. Welcome to Georgia. Uh, I would like to know if there is any character from a movie or a book that inspires you always and that inspires your books. Thank you. For me, the greatest novelists are Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Thomas Mann, Marcel Proust. These are the great um, um, writers, novelists who are, or I put on a pedestal, I teach them, I try, to, uh, I am, my work are inspired by them. Then there are also others, Calvino, Borges, Nabokov, Eco, many, many others from whom I've learned so much. Then I learned a lot from painting because I, yes, I wanted to be a painter. Movies, wow, there's no end to learn from movies. I love movies, but there's no end to it. I like Truffaut, I like Fellini, I like Scorchez now, David Lynch, someone was just talking about him. So many directors. And in my 20s, when there was no DVD, no video, no nothing, I used to go from one consulate to another from consulates, because they showed you European movies. Say you go to German consulate, watch German movies, French consulate, French. And that was the only way you can watch these movies, because television was also, there was no television or very weak. So I am a follower of the great art of the uh, cinema. Uh, I've learned so much, I can't think of an uh, intellectual or a writer or anyone without cinema. It's also some ethics, some uh, you just sit someplace and wait, and some magic will happen, and it happens. Um, and it's also your passive, it's just coming out, it's just entertaining your eyes first. Novels are harder, so you have to enter a novel, you have to uh, uh, give an effort, enter into the world of the novel. Who is this character? Is this his cousin? Why are they fighting? You ask this. But in a movie, you don't even ask, because Movies are making you enjoy what you see by the way they are designed by the pictures. I'm the Italian ambassador in town, uh, 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 so welcome also from the Italian side. Um, I am used to... Maybe I'll take a picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> now that she's an ambassador. <laughs> yes. 
I am more used to dealing with Turkey as an international power and uh, main actor of the region uh, with my Turkish culture, but actually I don't know Turkey and the Turkish society enough. So I just would like to ask you if you can uh, say a few words about how you can define the Turkish communities nowadays. How, for example, individuals are free from moral uh, fear of God. And how do you see this material world now? It's okay. really, it's, uh, um, you would understand immediately if I ask you, how would you define Italy in one sentence? You will be in trouble. Of course, countries change, and when you make a generalization that fast, I would say that it's not as mysteries as, as others say. It's a normal country. It's a country I love. It's a country I spent all my life in, and especially in Istanbul. How can I say, how can I reduce it? It's like reducing your life to a thing. But I felt honored by your question in a sense that, um, that uh, even for us Turks, it's sometimes hard to understand. That, uh, and, um, uh, we understand, we, sometimes we think uh, we understand our country, then when we try to express it to others, we, we're not sure that we have understood it enough. Now the country in the last three, four months especially is highly politically troubled, scandalously so, uh, but then I've seen so much in my life, I also have learned to take everything in a, uh, uh, in a cool way, but then it's, um, trying to sum up your country, trying to say something general about it. I can only express my sentiments, that I belong there, that I like it, that, I, that it's a sort of a fate for me, that I cannot think about, and, uh, that I belong it so deeply because that I write in Turkish, but that, that Turkish is a sort of blood to me or whatever, and then whatever happens, also language goes into it. Um, uh, but it's like saying, can you just in one sentence sum up your novels? And I cannot, but I wish I can. He's coming and he takes his books and goes. Oh, okay. It should be like this. Okay. <laughs>